everyone. Welcome to Research Talks and Practical Research on Wi-Fi. Before we start, let me share to you some of our house rules. Please do not share the Google Meet code. Moderators will be validating the email of the participants. Use the same email address that you registered with us. If you use different email address, inform us immediately. Third, please mute your microphone during the webinar proper and turn it on during the open forum, or if you have a question, be polite, do not interrupt. If you wish to speak or have any points or motion, use the raise hand icon. The facilitator or host will recognize you and allow you to speak. Fourth, be prepared in case we experience any technical difficulties. In case of technical difficulties, leave the meeting room and we join the meeting. Fifth, we are live both in YouTube channel, Beyond Books Publication TV, and Facebook page, Beyond Books Publication. Subscribe and follow to be updated on our research talk, Three Eyes or Inquiry, Investigation and Immersion every Wednesday, and Practical Research One every Friday. Feel free to share it to your friends and colleagues as well. If you have questions, please do not hesitate to email or contact us. You may contact us at Beyond Books Publication FB page, or you may call and text 0933-5564-886 or 0945-6130709. You may email us at Beyond Books Publication 2018 at gmail.com. To start our session, let us now have a prayer and patriotic song through an audiovisual presentation.
Thank you very much, Dr. Mayra Flores, for the doxology and patriotic song. Welcome to our research talk on Practical Research One. I am Cherry E. Garcia from the school's division of Sambales. You may also introduce yourself by maximizing the use of our chat box. You may state your name, location, and school where you belong in order for you to be recognized. I believe that our topic for tonight, review of related literature, will be very helpful in making our research. Our guest speaker will share to us how to select, cite, synthesize, and write coherent, coherent review of literature. Let us now hear a message from our practical research chairwoman, Dr. Maria Teresita Hirong Calapis from Dr. Pablito B. Mendoza Senior High School. Yes, Dr. Teresita. Okay, maganda gabi po sa lahat. Uh, I'm sorry, cannot open my ka. Medyo magulo sa aking paligid. Okay, so in behalf of Beyond Books Publication and Practical Research One team, a warm welcome to all of you, teacher participants and student participants, and of course, the facilitators and speakers of Practical Research One present today. So thank you so much for the overwhelming support from you for this weekly activity to promote research to the young minds and inculcate in them the value of research. I would like to say that research, no? should be part of our daily lives, not only for us teachers here, but of course for students, especially the grade 11 students who are present right now. Na dapat, uh, through this uh, series of activities, you will develop in yourself na what the message of research, na hindi ito mahirap, kundi ito ay isang proseso at ito ay nakakatulong sa atin for us to make this world we live in a better place. No? Kasi with the experience we have right now, talaga pong research can answer to this. At yan ang magpapaliwanag sa, sa ating lahat. No? So by understanding research and by doing it, we can, uh, we can make improvement kung ano yung uh, present situation natin ngayon. So, I hope that the, the weekly activity ay uh, isa puso ang isaisip natin. And then, from, from there, makakapag-contribute uh, tayo no? sa ating sarili, sa ating society, and even our country. So, let us continue to love research and spread the, the blessing of understanding research to one another. So, without further ado, welcome you here to this research talk or the fourth week of Practical Research One. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and uh, maraming maraming salamat pauna na po sa ating mahusay na resource speaker tonight. Okay? And of course, to the moderator, uh, Mom Cherry, and the people behind this uh, activity, thank you so much, Dr. Myra Flores, uh, Sir Jaben Lucian for, for the technical team, and of course, my, my supportive uh, co-chairman, Dr. Rio Santiago, and of course, the students of Dr. Pablito V. Mendoza Senior High. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Calapis, for that warm welcome. And now, it is my honor to introduce to you our resource speaker. Our resource speaker for tonight is a full-time senior high school faculty at Davao City National High School. He teaches qualitative and quantitative research subjects. He is also a part-time graduate school professor at University of the Immaculate Conception 
and an adjunct college lecturer at Christian College of Southeast Asia in Davao City. He graduated Doctor of Philosophy in Education, major in Applied Linguistics, and Master of Arts in Language, teaching major in English at the University of the Immaculate Conception and the University of Southeastern Philippines, respectively. He has been actively involved in national and international research trainings and workshops, both quantitative and qualitative research methods. He presented research papers, both in local and abroad. He has been invited as a speaker to local and national international webinar sessions, talking about language and linguistics, research methodologies, both in qualitative quantitative and mixed methods, research writing, literature review writing, and emerging teaching pedagogies in English and research. He has also been invited as judge to various international research conferences. Currently, he is an active peer reviewer of the International Journal of Linguistics with International Standard Serial Number of 1948-5425 a MacroThink Institute, and a member of Philippine Association of Researchers and Statistical Software Users, Mixed Methods International Research Organization, and an alumnus, now a member of the Secretariat of Southeast Asia Research Academy. My dear colleagues, students, friends, let us all welcome our resource speaker for tonight, Dr. Rex A. Lim. Let's, let us all give him a clap icon in our chat box. Yes, good, Sir Rex. Yes, good evening, everyone. Can you, am I audible on Sherry? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, thank you very much. May I now share my screen? I cannot share my screen so far. A host, please enable me. All right, uh, once again, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much to those who are in the Zoom room and to those who are watching in our YouTube live and our Facebook Live. Thank you very much, host, uh, for enabling the feature. Okay, let me now share my screen. Are you now seeing my screen, Ma'am Sherry? Yes, sir. Okay. It is visible. All right, so let me now begin. Okay, all right. So I'm sorry for my background noise. Once again, good uh, evening, everybody. So my talk this afternoon is, I mean, this evening is a view of related literature. Once again, my name is Rex Lim from uh, Davao City. So my talk uh, this evening revolves around the following topics or competencies, selection or selects relevant pieces of literature. We have sites related literature using standard style. In the case of research, we're going to follow American Psychological Association format or APA style. We have synthesizes information from relevant literature and writes a coherent review of literature. So these competencies were taken from the most essential learning competencies released by the Department of Education. So let me now begin my talk by showing to you the following uh, with, with, with the following information as a process of reviewing related literature. We have here three key concepts. We have identification, location, and analysis of material. So in, in conducting review of related literature, it's not as easy as what we think. Because in the first place, there must be a systematic identification, systematic location, and systematic analysis of related material. When I say systematic identification, that involves um, an, um, a, a prior knowledge of what you're going to look for on the net. You cannot just go to the net, you cannot just go to the Google Scholar and, such, and just search there anything that you want, anything under the sun. There must be an idea that you should know ahead of time what to look for on the net or on a particular database, for example. That's what we mean by systematic identification. Next is systematic location, that after you have identified relevant sources, relevant materials, you should be able to properly locate them, you should be able to properly store them, you should be able to properly sort them in a particular, for example, folder, in a particular reference manager tool, or in a particular 
for example, software, okay, that you're going to use. Later on, I'll be uh, showing to you, I'll be giving to you certain reference manager tools which uh, can be of help in your review of uh, related literature. And the third process in conducting review of related literature is analysis of material. You see that we have systematic identification, systematic location of related material, and systematic analysis of relevant sources before you can have the formal writing of your review of related literature section of your paper. As we know, review of related literature can be a method or can be part and parcel of a research paper. And now my talk this evening um, focuses on review of related literature as only part and parcel of the paper and not necessarily a method. But then again, looking at the process, review of related literature is an act of research by itself. Imagine reading, rereading, rereading relevant literature. You imagine the process of analysis before you can write the actual review of related literature a section of your paper. So that's why research appears daunting to many, not even to the students, but also to teachers because of this uh, taxing endeavor. That's why we are here. We're conducting this kind of, of initiative. We thank for Dr. Um, Dunilo Capulso for this initiative to help our students as well as um, enrich knowledge of our teachers relevant to particular competencies in, in K-12. So why conduct a review of related literature? It says here, according to John of Salisbury, we are like dwarves, okay? We uh, um, teachers, we students, okay, you students, we're like dwarves sitting on the shoulders of giants. We see more and things that are more distant than they did, not because our sight is superior or because we are taller than they, but because they raise us up and by their great stature add to ours. So very meaningful that... um. By consulting previously conducted studies, it's like we are standing tall in the shoulders of giants because we know what we're going to do. We have already we have already benchmarked previously conducted studies and and we able to refine well our methodology and we know how can we do better in a way we navigate in our research. So it's always important to look for and to consult previously conducted studies. And that gives us the following purposes of reviewing literature, why it is reviewing literature is like standing tall in the shoulders of giants. First is to determine what has already been done that relates to your topic, okay? That's why we have to consult previously conducted studies in order we researchers so we know uh, what has already been done and what has not yet been done so we cannot duplicate okay things or research areas which were already done in the past next is to prevent you from unintentionally duplicating research that has already been conducted as we know an act of duplication is an act of plagiarism and in academe in an academic realm duplication is a taboo it's a question of your integrity so for you to um, Avoid um, an intentional uh, duplication. We have to consult previous studies. We have to consult what's already um, published, okay, in the in in journals, for example, as it's already the trend now. Traceability. So you have to make use of Google scholars. You have to make use of different databases as our sources of our. Uh, related literature to enable you to acquire a full understanding of your topic very important because uh, conducting review of related literature is one way of becoming an expert in our study becoming an expert in our methodology but becoming an expert in our problem as well and to provide the rationale for your research problem you know there's a very good metaphor here a review of related literature as an arbiter as an attorney in our paper because it always justifies okay it always uh, it provides justification of why you use this kind of methodology, why your problem is really a problem, what's the gap of your research. So therefore, it always provides, okay, rationality for your research problem. It acts as an attorney, okay? So that's a very important that you should have a solid foundation of your RRL in your review of related literature before you're going to proceed the actual conduct of study. Because even if you have already conducted your study, but later on, you you will find out that it's a mere duplic duplication of what has already been in the field, what has already been in the 
in in uh yeah in the field therefore it, it's it's useless why because the very core why we're conducting study where we're conducting research is to contribute to the existing body of knowledge to contribute to the pool of knowledge and what can we contribute then if what we're doing is a mere duplication of what has been already conducted next is to identify a space for your own work it's uh, uh yeah it's a scholarly way of saying that we have to identify the gap of our study that we we have to identify the gap. We have to identify the novelty of our research. That conducting research is not just, um, uh, you know, a, a mere requirement. Although you're uh, you're you're still in grade eleven, okay, still so your high school, but it must be injected in our mind that we conduct research because we want to contribute. Okay, to the solution. We want to contribute to the existing body of knowledge. Hence, we should be able to identify, establish the space where we can get in, where we can contribute, where we can say something, okay, to the problem. It says here, according to Merkel 2016, that there is no reason to reinvent the wheel when it may not be necessary. Again, there's no point of duplicating what has already been done because, again, we have to contribute, okay? to the solution to the problem. We have to contribute to the existing body of knowledge. So when to stop reviewing literature? Okay, when are we going to stop reviewing literature? If the answer to all of these questions is yes, then therefore it's the very time that we have to stop reviewing literature. First is do you understand the current trends in the field? If you have already understood the current trends in the field, then therefore, okay, okay, it's, it's a check, it's all right. Do you understand the historical context of your topic? Very important that we can understand the historical context. Remember that we need to establish the pattern. We should be able to trace the development okay of our problem uh, from then up to now so we'll be able to 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 have a very good grip of the context of how we're going to attack our problem next have you uncovered research that examines both or all sides of the issue as what i already mentioned that conducting review of related literature is one way of becoming an expert in our field so we have to know both ends both sides of of our research those which counter argue our possible findings and those which will back up those which will reinforce our possible findings in our study do you believe that you have enough information to design a good research project if we do review of related literature if we consult previously conducted studies we'll be able to benchmark of how they did their study in a way you'll be able to properly refine okay your own study so uh, we have here a very good concept, five years span from present, okay, as to the timeliness of your paper as much as possible, five years span from, pre from present, or we, we have also here no formula, but what is really the real score? We have five years span from present if it is a, an empirical study or if it is a primary study, those which were uh, really conducted by, by researchers, for example, those who will be, who were conduct, who conduct conducted like um experimental pure experimental like that primary studies empirical studies so five years span in fact we can extend that up to 10 years okay five to ten years span from the present if it goes beyond 10 years then it's no longer good to be included in your current study why because what were true yesterday may not be true today especially in social sciences behaviors change okay people change and so findings also change so if that's the case, uh, if it's 10 years old and beyond, then, then these studies are already good for replication. We have to reconduct the study. We have to retest the study to validate the findings, whether the findings are still true today. However, there is a, a, a very good concept of, of no formula. No formula if it's a theoretical paper. If it's, yeah, if it's a theoretical paper, for example, you are studying about, uh, for example, in, in, in language, the affective filter hypothesis by Stephen Krashen. Of course, it's um, established way back time. However, you cannot proceed your paper, okay? You cannot proceed your analysis if you will not anchor your study to particular theories, to per particular assumptions, to particular presuppositions. And so there's no formula relative to a theoretical paper. In fact, the older, the better. However, if there is a development of the theory, we have to include the original theory plus the 
uh, development of the theory. Again, this five to ten year rule in, in, in review of related literature is only applicable for empirical research and for theoretical paper, uh, no problem with that. You look at this one. There, there is a meme. Finally found a relevant paper for your study referring to an empirical paper. And you look at that very sad. The paper was written in 1962. So you imagine that 1962 and to date, we are now 2021, and so therefore it's very old. So, so that already, um, I mean, that paper is already considered, it can be considered for what? Replication. We have to reconduct the study in order to validate okay, its findings, whether or not they are still practical or functional in our context. So there's a contention here. Scholars before researchers, okay, um, according to Bute and Bailey 2003, they argue that a substantive, thorough, sophisticated literature review is a precondition for doing substantive, thorough, sophisticated research, and therefore that one must be a scholar before a researcher, okay? That's why I'm always telling my students that the quality of your paper is dependent on the quality of your references that you have to consult first, uh, consult first previous studies before you have to conduct your current study now. However, Maxwell 2006 had a different view on, on the previews. Uh, Maxwell um, um, maintained that one merely needs to be familiar with the relevant literature to properly situate a study. So Maxwell here doesn't emphasize that you really have to have a thorough literature review before you're going to conduct the study. He only argues that one needs to merely familiar okay, with the relevant literature and then we're going to conduct the study. Now the very question, where do you stand on the issue? Okay, this question goes to the students and goes to the teachers as well. Do you agree with Bootsy and Bailey or with Maxwell? And what might be the position of your advisor for you as a teacher or supervisor or graduate chair if you have, of course, referring to your teacher? What is your stand? Should we do extensive literature review prior to the conduct of the study or after the conduct of the study? Okay. Or um, the another question that can be um, related to this is, uh, would this be relative to a particular approach? Would this be relative to a particular design? Uh, for example, quantitatively done or qualitatively done? So that's another contention. Um, there's always a question and a debate on, are we going to conduct okay, literature, review of related literature before asking questions and data collection, specifically related to qualitative literature review? Are we going to conduct extensive literature review after data collection and data analysis? Which is which? Now here's the answer. Uh, for a phenomenological study, here you have in the first concept, in phenomenological study, literature is reviewed following data collection. As much as possible, we do literature review after data collection, and maybe after data analysis, because the very core of phenomenological study is to what? To understand the essence of their experiences. And so therefore, if you're going to conduct uh, extensive literature review pri uh, prior to okay, the conduct of the study, we might be able to to influence okay, our analysis later on of the data. We might be able to, um, to include our own biases in the analysis of the data later. So as much as possible, if it's a phenomenological study, extensive literature review must be conducted after data collection or at least after data analysis. If it's a grounded theory, basically much more okay, that we have to conduct extensive literature review after concept development. As we know that the very core of grounded theory is to what? Establish or to come up with a theory. And as much as possible, it must be without bias, okay? As much as possible. Of course, we cannot avoid biases, but as much as possible, we have to lessen uh, uh, biases in the analysis of the data. Hence, literature review must be conducted. I mean, extensive literature review must be conducted after theory um, development. What about if it's an ethnographic research? Okay, here, ethnographic research. It says here that literature review before data collection must be extensively done. Why? Because basically, this is, a literature, this is an ethnographic study. And if it is an ethnographic study, we're studying a particular culture, you will, be, you will eat with, the, with them, okay? The people of a particular culture, you sleep with them, you identify yourself as one of them. You imagine that. So therefore, there is a need to know 
okay, to, to understand fully a particular culture before you're going to conduct that study. Very important that extensive literature review must be Okay, must be conducted prior to conducting an ethnographic study. What about a case study or a narrative study in qualitative research? Well, there is no problem with that because it's not so much of a sensitive um, uh, topic, okay, and related to case study and narrative study. Therefore, we can just have um, uh, literature review both before and after approaches are employed in a case study and in a narrative study. But with quantitative research, it's really not a question. You should have to have a thorough literature review before you conduct your study. Why? Because quantitative research is about testing of hypotheses. It's about testing a theory. And so therefore, you should have a very good understanding of your theory. You should have a very good understanding of your problem. So you'll be able to come up with a very good and sound hypothesis. Remember that hypothesis is an educated guess. And it must be informed by your review of related literature. Now let's proceed to the first competency, selection of relevant literature. Now, in terms of the concept of relevant literature, it's you as a researcher can validate that, whether these pieces of literature are relevant to your study, to your problem or not, because you are the ones conducting your study. Although as teachers, you can validate, but you as a researcher, as students, you have the say, whether these pieces of literature are relevant to your study or not, because you know better your study than your teacher. That's an assumption because you are the ones conducting your study. Now, the next uh, point in question is where are we going to get, okay, outsource our what? Our, our, our sources, our relevant literature. So it's what you can see on your screen and actually different indexing companies, but they're also databases. For example, Index Copernicus, we have Google, we have Crossref. You can visit Crossref. It houses millions of journals and papers. You go to Google Scholar, it houses also millions and even billions of papers and journals, which can be of help greatly to your to your study, okay? As um, um, Especially in a public school, we can really uh, take advantage of, of, of Google Scholar. But in a private school where they have subscriptions to a particular database, ProQuest, for example, will the better. But for, for us, especially in the public school, we can just take advantage of the of Google Scholar. It provides vast of resources which are also reliable. So in Google Scholar, we can actually, this is a very, it is a very good database indexing company. It has also its feature, which is a very um, student friendly. Okay, you can customize the range here, here. As we already talked about, we can have a five to 10 year span, okay, to be included in our in our paper. So you can just click here, custom range, okay, and indicate here the year. And very important that there is what? An automatic citation generator. You can just click here, this one, the quotation symbol, and we can just simply copy and paste here the APA citation style to our paper. So therefore, no sweat. So I, I highly recommend Google Scholar to all our students, okay, especially in the public school, as what I mentioned, those who do not have subscription to a particular database. Now, how are we going to search, okay, our, our, um, uh, how, how are we going to make sure in order that what we're looking for in, um, in Google Scholar, for example, are or yeah, are relevant to our research topic? We can make use of Boolean technique, okay? Boolean technique, for example, A or B, and this is a very specific for quantitative research where A is the first variable and B is the second variable. Since this is a qualitative research, then we can focus on a particular problem. For example, you'd like to know about the lived experiences, okay? of COVID-19 frontliners. So you can just key in the search engine about, yeah, of course, experiences of COVID-19 frontliners. And you can play with the, uh, with the, with, with synonyms, okay, of experiences. You can uh, locate, you can make use of the term perspectives, you can make use of the term insights, like joys, okay, struggles, since you're looking for experiences, all right? But again, this must be done after data collection, after data analysis, so that uh, in the analysis portion, you'll not be able to, you know, um, um, 
um, incorporate your own biases as much as possible in the analysis. So Boolean searching is very important. You have to make use of keywords. Yeah, you have to make use of keywords to properly locate relevant literature. The one that the one that you have in your screen are very specific for quantitative research where you have the variables. Okay, the combination of the variables. And and where where are we going to store? Okay, our downloaded materials. So basically, you'll be searching on the net, and after that, if you feel Okay, if you think that this paper is relevant to your to your study, you're going to download the, the paper. And we have to be remember systematic identification. The second concept of review of related literature is systematic location. We have to properly locate them. We have to properly store them in our, for example, in our computer. Okay, so we can make use of reference manager tools. We have the EndNote 9, X9. This is actually a product of private analytics. Okay, this is for a price, so therefore we cannot uh, more or less, um, this is not recommended. ProSite as well is a very good reference manager tool. This is not also uh, free, but Mendeley is free. This is a product of Elsevier, yes, Copos. This is a very good um, reference manager tool. I'm using this one, so therefore I can highly recommend this one. We have also Zotero, which I am not able to include here, but it's a free reference manager tool. We have to adopt this technology. I'm telling you, we have to adapt uh, to these technology. Yeah, pro, yeah, because this is the trend now. We have to to keep abreast with what is uh, with the development. However, if we do not have these, um, if we do not have the technology, I mean, if we do not have the computer, for example, then therefore you can just have them in folder. Like, okay, this particular folder is good for one variable, one concept, okay? Another for folder I refer is, um, our, is the folder good for another, for the references of another variable, then another folder, for uh, another uh, no, for another references, okay, that you're going to include there. So you can group them in a particular folder if in case you didn't have or you cannot yeah, avail, okay, if you, if, you, if you cannot afford, if you do not have the technology to maximize the following um, sources. Um, and, and Note 9, uh, we have ProSite and Mendeley. Again, I highly recommend Mendeley. I also highly recommend Zotero because they have, they have that uh, particular application embedded in, in, in Word where you can just easily carry uh, over the, uh, the citation in, your, in, in the Word, okay? Following the APA format. It's really not a problem. Next, we have next competency. It cites related literature using standard style. As what I already mentioned, we are going to follow the APA format, American Psychological Association format. But just to give you an overview, the difference between MLA and APA, because these are the two um, mostly used, okay? Uh, in, in, in the academia, we have the MLA and we also have the APA. MLA is for a modern language association format used for liberal arts and humanities. However, APA usually used with studies relating to social sciences. So however, it's indicated in the manual that we're going to use APA if you're going to write a thesis and dissertation. So this is just to give you uh, a quick overview, quick difference between APA and MLA citation format. Here, it's included in the a list of reference, okay? We have the first author here. This is um, an example of an APA citation format. You'll have the authors, a first author, second author, and the third author. Uh, and we have the, the last author, the fourth author. As what you can see, you have the last name, um, which is not abbreviated. The first name is abbreviated. You have to be very careful in the punctuation marks, okay? We have the last name, comma. We have the initial of the first name, period, then comma, to separate the first author with the second author. Second author, last name, comma. Then you have the names here, J, okay, initial, then period. Then we have comma, then the, the, the third author, and so on and so forth. As what you can see, you have here, ampersand. It's not spelled out, okay? You have only the ampersand followed by the year of publication. So take note of that. You have the author followed by the year of publication, followed by the title of the article, okay? Title of the article, then followed by the name of the journal, Cognitive Development. Then we have here the... Um, we have the volume, um, sorry for that. We have the journal volume number 30, 36 and we have the page number 20 to 30. So this is uh, the, the major arrangement okay, of an APA format. However, in an MLA format, that's what you can see here. If it's uh, only two, you have, for example, the first author, Quack, 
this is the last name, Yang Bin. You look at that, the first name is no longer abbreviated. It's spelled out, Kwak Yang Bin. And you look at here, there's no use of the symbol of the ampersand. It's really spelled out. And, and you look at the second author, you have here the first name, last name basis. And like in APA format, where you have the last name, then first name basis here, only the first author follows the format, last name, first name. And the second author and the rest follows the first name, last name format in MLA, then followed by what? The title of the article, no longer the year of publication. Unlike in APA, we have here the, um, sorry, we have here the year of publication after the authors, all right? Then you have uh, the same thing, uh, the title of the article, you have here the name of the journal, Cognitive Development, you have the uh, volume number, journal number, after which we have the year, as indicated in your screen, you have the year column, and you have here the page number. So that's the main difference between APA and MLA format. Now, another one, if it's more than three authors, automatic, the MLA format, um, um, makes use of et al, okay, and others. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the rest of the authors are no longer included in the citation style. If it's just two, then you'll be able to see the first and the second author. But if it's more than two, we can only see et al here. So this is the major difference between APA and MLA. Now let's focus on APA, American Psychological Citation, um, American Psychological Association format. Here, as what you can see in your screen, is the in-text citation format um, uh, lifted from APA 7th edition, okay? So we have here the parenthetical citation and we have narrative citation. Remember, this is in-text citation format. It's within the paragraph. All right, it's within the paragraph. Now, if we if we only have one author, if it's parenthetical citation, if it's parenthetical citation, it's more of idea prominent. For example, um, love is blind. Sorry for the example. <laughs> love is blind, Luna 2020. If it's narrative citation, it's more of an author prominent. Okay, like Luna 2020 argued that love is blind okay so we have here it's parenthetical citation enclosed with parentheses last name comma in the year if it's narrative citation you have luna then you have here the year enclosed in parentheses two authors as what you can see inside the parentheses and parenthetical citation with the use of ampersand in narrative citation no need for the ampersand you have to spell out salas and the other one. If, if, if it is three or more authors, automatic in the first citation, you have to make use of et al. Okay. And like in the sixth edition, it says that in the first citation, you really have to spell out all the authors. But in the seventh edition, in the first mention, you have to make use of et al. All right. A narrative citation, of course, Martin et al. 2020. Always remember, always be very careful in the punctuation marks. All right. A group author with abbreviation, first citation, okay? In the first citation, first mention, you'll have to have National Institute of Mental Health. You have to spell out, then you provide in brackets the abbreviation, then comma outside the brackets, 2020. Then, of course, inside the parenthesis and parenthetical citation, and you'll have the narrative citation here. It's um, self-explanatory. For the subsequent citations, you just have to provide the... Um, the acronym, okay, and the year of publication, and so with the narrative citation. If it's a group author without abbreviation, so you can see that you just have to provide the institution, for example, Stanford University, comma, in the year of publication. Very simple, okay? Now, I would like to emphasize here that there must be a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between uh, your in-text citation and the reference list entry, meaning to say whatever you have in the body, okay, whatever you have in the body in your paper must be reflected properly, okay, in your reference list section. For example, you have here parenthetical citation, Alexander. This uh, Alexander must be traceable to your reference list entry, okay? It must be traceable. Why? Because this is an academic paper, we have to be honest, or else we will be accused of fabricating what authors in our paper. All right, uh, let's proceed to reference list entry in the last portion of your paper. There, these are the elements. You have the author, the date, the title, and the source. Very important that these four elements must be seen, okay, must be identified in your reference uh, list entry, okay? 
uh, in, in the reference list section of your paper. The author who is responsible for the work, the date, when was the work published, and the title, what is this work called, and the source, where can I retrieve um, this work? Now, this is an example of a journal where you can actually trace those elements. For example, you have here the date, 2018. You have here the name, the, artic the title of the article. We have here the author, and you have here the source. As what you have observed, the source now is the DOI. That's it. That is now the, the trend now, this direct object um, uh, digital object identifier, okay? It's actually a combination of letters and numbers assigned to a particular journal. Now, if you're going to look for the journal, you can just copy and paste the UI in the search engine and automatically you will be able to get the paper, okay? It, yeah, DOI is a trend now. However, not all journals have DOI because DOI is actually the... Um, um, the is actually owned by Crossref. And uh, most of the highly reputed journals are subscribed to DUI in Crossref. So what we're seeing right now is a very good journal because it, it has a particular DOI, digital object um, identifier. And that's what we're looking for if you're going to look for, for, for sources, those which have DUI. What about those? Uh, how, how are we going to create a reference when information is missing? Okay, when information is missing, remember the elements, we have the title, we have the date, we have the author, and we have the source. What if one is missing? However, this uh, document, this paper is very relevant to your paper, but then uh, some elements are missing. What are we going to do? So nothing, all elements are present, so you can have this one. Uh, okay, uh, we can have the reference list entry, author, date, title, and source for the in-text citation. We have here the parenthetical and we have here the narrative citation. I know you cannot memorize all, okay, but then at least I am giving you what you're going to do. What if the author is missing? You're going to provide the title. If the author is missing, just provide the title, provide the date and the source. So the reference list entry looks like this. You have the title here. Okay, the date, the source, in-text citation, no problem. You have the title, the year. Of course, you have the title, the year. What about the date is missing? We have the author, provide the author, then ND. You write ND to signify no date. You'll have title, you have the source, and you'll have here for the in-text citation. What about the title is missing? You just have to provide the author, the date, then in bracket, description of the work. Okay, description of the work, then you'll have the source. Okay, then author year, author year for the in-text citation. What about author and date are missing? You just have to provide the title, ND for no date. Okay, and you'll have to provide the source here. And then same thing here in the in-text citation, title, ND, ND. Author and title, you're going to provide the description of the work in the reference list entry, provide the date, and then the source. And you look at here the in-text citation. For those um, um, missing uh, date and title, you're going to what? Provide the author in ND in brackets, description of the work and in the source. And you look at here the in-text citation. You have author ND. Okay, author ND for, for in-text, uh, for the narrative, uh, for the um, parenthetical and narrative citation. What about if author date and title are missing? However, the work is very important, okay? You, you have to provide the description of the work, and the, then you have to provide the source here, the format for in-text citation. However, as much as possible, all the elements must be present, okay? Must be present in your list uh, of, uh, I mean, in, in your reference list, as much as possible. Again, uh, uh, exemption to the rule is when this particular document is very necessary, is considered um, seminal, okay, in your work, that you cannot proceed your work without this paper. Well, that can be justified anyway in your paper, all right? Especially if you do publication, that's always a, a question. So as much as possible, you have to include reference materials which have complete items or elements. What about if you're going to make use of books and other um, reference materials, okay, in your work, you just have to follow very basic. This is the formula. You don't need to memorize. You have the author or editor. You have the date, the title, publisher, information, and you have the DOI or URL. As what you have noticed, DOI, URL are required now, okay, even in book. Okay, even in books. Why? Because the very concept of research now is traceability, that your sources must be properly uh, traceable. 
in 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 online okay databases that's why we have to that's why DOI is required for example books um are sold in in for example Amazon they already have DOI we have already the link so therefore it's traceable because if it's not traceable it's branded as gray literature and gray literature is not recommended because uh, for example um, peer reviewers editors for example of, of journals cannot uh, validate okay the credibility of your sources whether or not they're really existing so we need to to have um, sources from online really with an appropriate DOI. Next is um, synthesizes information from relevant literature, another competency. Again, synthesizes information from relevant literature. If you're going to take the word synthesis, okay, this is, if you look at the pyramid, okay, according to Anderson, okay, actually it was Bloom's, but now Anderson, synthesizing now is at the the, the peak okay of the pyramid meaning to say uh, when we do when we synthesize it calls for a higher order uh, thinking skill and we cannot do uh, we cannot synthesize if we know if we do not know how to evaluate we cannot synthesize and, and, and writing review of related literature section is an act of synthesis okay it's actually it's, it's actually the process of you know putting together, Okay, raw elements from various sources to make to make something new. Okay, to make something original. Do you imagine that? That's a review of related literature is a daunting task because it demands intellectual um, uh, effort. Okay, and it demands intellectual creativity in the process of writing now in your paper. Now, as what I mentioned, we cannot go directly to um, to writing the the actual review of related literature section. There must be what systematic analysis. We'll go back to the three key concepts I introduced in the in the. In, in, at the beginning, we have a systematic identification of relevant literature, systematic location, and the third now, systematic analysis before we can do synthesis. Here's now I'm showing to you is a matrix method. Actually, you have here the matrix for you to be guided how you're going to analyze, okay, gathered pieces of literature. Because if you gather them, okay, you gather them, but then you have to make meaning of what you have gathered. And matrix method will help you a lot. Okay, from the word itself, matrix, this is a matrix. For example, uh, you're going to provide here, these are the elements that you will look for in the paper. Study details, the author date, study publication, you're going to write it here for the first uh, journal, for example, first source. Methodological approach, you're going to write it here. Theoretical conceptual framework, you write it here. Research sample, research site, research problem, research purpose, research question, the sub question, the key findings, conclusion, and recommendation. So again, this is not absolute, meaning to say you can actually trim down the, the matrix, which you think na, um, if the elements are not necessary, I can also add uh, some elements which you think you need uh, from your sources. But basically, this will help you a lot in, uh, in your analysis later, okay, in your analysis later. Um, uh, uh, also, later, as we go along, I'm going to show to you an accomplished uh, matrix uh, matrix uh, method, okay, the one that I'm presenting to you now. Next, we can also have this template. If you are not comfortable with this template, then you can have this template. Uh, this is more of vertical, you know, it's just the orientation. This one, it's more of horizontal. This one is more of vertical, all right? Uh, we can have here research topic, methodology, findings, limitations, areas for future uh, research. And you can, again, you can add elements which you think are necessary in your work. So what's the... What's uh, the importance of this um, uh, matrix method? You learn something about the sociology of the subject you are reviewing, for example, who the researcher, researchers are and with whom they collaborate, where the research is being done, whether they tend to use the same data sets, which, which studies are cited repeatedly, you are able to state questions of your own, a better sense of what is missing and areas in which new research is needed because you'll be able to spot um, clearly of what is missing, the, the gap of research, for example, and you'll be able to create an order out of chaos given that there are lots of references that are relevant to your study. So here is now, I'm sorry. So here is now an example of a matrix um, method, okay? But this is an accomplished one. So uh, here, source of information, uh, 
uh, you have the first journal, first paper, John Co. 2015, the author, Karpinski, Kirsner, and Lau 2017. What's the research topic or question? You're going to list them down here. What's the methodology? You're going to list them down. Findings, what are the findings? Limitations, what are the limitations? Areas of future research, what are the areas of future research? Now, let's try to focus on the findings as we are uh, curious about establishing the gap of the study. You look at it from John Co. 2015, FB bad for academic performance. So FB, bad for academic performance. What about Karpinski? Relation between FB use and GPA, but it doesn't say anything whether the relationship is negative or positive. What about Kirsner and Karpinski? FB users lower GPA. So meaning to say there is more or less a negative correlation between the use of FB and academic performance. You look at Lao 2017, non-academic non FB use and multitasking for academic performance. So there is indeed a relationship. And looking at this, we'll be able to spot the, uh, the common theme here that somehow there is a negative correlation between FBUs and academic performance. You'll be able to spot here very clearly uh, commonality of your sources, all right? And the limitations as well, very important in the analysis part. Remember, we are still in the analysis part. We are not yet on what? Synthesizing on the writing part. And there you go. You'll be able to synthesize now. Okay. Again, this phase is still on the analysis part. This phase is still analysis. And he, there you are, the synthesis part. Okay. Uh, analysis is the process of breaking together complex elements into understandable form. And the opposite of analysis is synthesis. Because in synthesis, you'll be pulling together, okay? You, you look at this one. You'll be pulling together raw elements into something new, into something whole, into something original. So you are creating something new out from what's already existing. That is synthesis. You look at that. From John Co. 2015, Carpinski 2013, Kirsten and Carpinski 2010, you have here, you'll be able to find what? A theme based on the analysis level using matrix method. There is a negative relationship between Facebook use and GPA. And this particular theme now can be part of your heading later on in your review of related literature section where you can label their negative relationship, okay, relationship between Facebook use and GPA. And here is an example of what, uh, just an excerpt actually of a review of related uh, literature section. Um, by the way, you, you don't need to uh, um, follow the format because it's quite complicated. For students, we can just have the, 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 the most common paragraph development where we have the main idea, then you have the supporting details. The supporting details include now an explication of the findings to to, to provide proof of your argument that indeed there is a negative correlation between FBUs and academic performance. All right, uh, we're running out of time. Let's proceed uh, right away to writing a coherent review of literature, okay? We're now done in the analysis, synthesis, and with a very slim uh, demarcation line, coherent review of literature. It must be coherent, okay? Effective scholarly writing balances continuity and flow with conciseness and clarity. Continuity and flow, all right? That there must be um, a fluidity of one of, of one idea for one paragraph to the next paragraph. But it doesn't mean that you have to be verbose. It doesn't mean that you have to be wordy. Remember, continuity and flow must be balanced with conciseness. You have to be direct to the point and clarity. You have to be clear. You have to make use of simple words, okay? Layman's term. Okay, in order, to, um, in order to achieve continuity and flow, we're going to make use of transitions. Time linkers, for example, then, next, after, while, since, cause and effect links. You have there addition links, contrast links, very important. So you'll know whether this paragraph is actually counter-arguing the, the, the first paragraph, whether this paragraph is adding information with the first paragraph, and so on and so forth. They're also called a signposting, actually meta discourse in linguistics. Very important so that your reader will know uh, what, what we're doing here and where, where am I now? As a reader, I know where I am in the paper. I am now in the conclusion part. I am now in the, in the part where you are contradicting with existing literature and so on and so, and so forth. Wordiness and redundancy, we have to remember, we have to be 
you know, concise, okay? Wordy, at the present time, concise now. Okay, we have to be concise. So, therefore, avoid uh, verbosity. Avoid uh, wordiness in your paper for the purpose of why not use four when they're just the same? There were several students that completed. Why not use several students completed? So, as much as possible, you have to be concise in your in your statements, okay? Um, um, we have to uh, we have to be direct to the point. Why why do we need to be uh, direct to the point? Because this is an academic paper, and there's no room for for what for for winding you know sentences for for figurative language for idiomatic expressions. They have no room for academic research. You have to go direct to the point. It must be plain and simple because your point is to communicate the findings. That's why you're right because you want to contribute to the body of knowledge. Now, if the recipient, if the readers do not understand understand okay what you are talking about so therefore why conduct research in the first place it's like you you know you defeat your own purpose of conducting research wordiness and redundancy they were both alike you can re actually remove both they were alike a sum total the same thing a total four different groups four groups were exactly the same were the same absolutely essential essential if it's essential absolutely has been previously found has been found it's yeah previously has been found the same thing small in size small okay one at this one and the same the same in proximity to in uh you remove close completely unanimous unanimous position very close position close period of time time summarize briefly summarize okay briefly uh, summarize and the reason is uh, because the reason is, then you state your reason. Because, then state your reason. You don't need to uh, uh, state them all in one sentence. The reason is because it's a redundancy. Okay? It's redundancy. <laughs> that would help a lot. That would help a lot. Okay. What about in sentence and paragraph length? It says here, according to APA seventh, uh, according to APA manual seventh edition, there is no minimum or maximum sentence length in APA style. However, overuse of short, simple sentences produces choppy prose. However, overuse of long, involved sentences results in difficult, sometimes incomprehensible language. It's already overloaded. If you have lengthy, I mean, if you have complex sentences, especially compound complex sentences so as much possible you have yeah simple you have compound yeah you also have complex but compound complex sentence is no longer uh, advisable because it's already loaded with ideas and it's no and it's already difficult okay for some individuals to understand the idea all right embedded in the sentence what about the tone in writing um, a research paper academic paper Okay, ideas and findings should be a direct, straightforward manner while also aiming for an interesting and compelling style. Exactly, direct, straightforward manner is what I mentioned. There's no need for what? Um, Idiomatic expressions, figurative languages, no need for that. It's a taboo in academic writing. But you have to have a style, okay? You have to have a particular format. You have to have a particular logic, a particular flow, so that readers know, so that readers will become interested in reading your paper. Use languages that can base professionalism and formality. And what now qualifies professional and formal in terms of language? Avoid the use of contraction. You have to spell out because contraction is actually a, you know, it's part of, of communicative grammar. Um, um, for spontaneity, you know, that's why we, we make use of contraction. But in academic paper, you have to spell out it is, you are, we are, okay? No use of contractions. And as much as possible, we have to avoid jargon. Remember, I told you that we write because we want to communicate. Okay, if it con if our, our if the message, I mean, if our findings confuse our reader, or our reader cannot understand our, our findings, cannot understand our language. So therefore, again, it defeats its own its very own purpose. And and my final note, I am almost done. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, your review tells a story by critically analyzing the literature and arriving at specific conclusions about it. Always remember that reviewing literature is not simply as a laundry list that you're just going to put them together, lap them together, and that's it. It needs, I'm sorry for the background, it needs a critical evaluation, okay? A previous literature to inform your current practice. And as a cliche, 
you cannot cram the RL. Basically, knowing that you need to, to be what? There must be a systematic identification of relevant literature, systematic location, and systematic analysis before you can formally write your RL section. So basically, you cannot cram the RRL. It cannot be done overnight. That's why you have to do it ahead of time. It says here, um, research is spending six hours reading 35 papers so you can write one sentence containing two references. And this um, sounds familiar to many of us, especially to our, student, but, to our students. But if you're going to follow what I just told you, that you have to be systematic in identification of the problem, relevant material. You have to be systematic in locating them, in storing them. If you have to be systematic in your analysis, so basically you can avoid this um, scenario. Imagine spending six hours reading 35 papers and you're just able to get two references. What about the other papers? So meaning they're irrelevant since you're, you're not able to use them. You see that? And uh, yeah, this is my final slide. It says here, when you copy an idea of a writer, it's called plagiarism. When you copy the ideas of many people, it's called a PhD. Imagine you're synthesizing. That's what I mentioned. Synthesizing, you're pulling together raw data, raw information from various sources, and making them. Uh, so you and and you make the you make something new. Okay, out from what's already existing. And here's my references if you would like to know more about what I'm presenting this afternoon. And once again, thank you very much, BN Books Publication, for this opportunity to share with our teachers and to our, um, our senior high school students. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Mom Cherry. Thank you very much, Dr. Rex A. Lim, for that very informative talk on review of related literature. Allow me, sir, to read some of the messages in our chat box. We have from we have a commendation from our very own Dr. Linilo Capulso, and he said, "Very insightful, Dr. Rex. Very up to date. Thank you and congratulations." From Ilaya Luis Tanay. She said, this is the first time I learned of the citation in Google Scholar. Thanks, sir. It will help a lot. And from Glenny and Ramirez, thank you for the knowledge, sir. It will help a lot. And from Louis Boy Monser, on behalf of our school or university, I would like to thank you for inviting me to our webinar. Your webinar meeting is relevant and very informative to us and for me. As a student of the Lubhasaan ng Lungsod ng San Pablo from Laguna 4A, I will be using this knowledge you provided to make improvements in our research studies. We really appreciate the effort that you provided us to knowledge that which will help us to continue providing meaningful content. We know you're probably be really busy and we're grateful for the time you've spent telling us about your experiences, insight for this wonderful meeting. We value your experience and knowledge and will use it to help and to teach others. Thank you and God bless. Thank you very much for those appreciation. With your discussion, sir, our participants are now more knowledgeable on how to select relevant pieces of literature. I am sure our learners have enriched their knowledge on how to properly cite related literature using standard style and can now accurately synthesize information from relevant literature. Most importantly, participants are now more knowledgeable on how to write a current review of related literature. This will be a great help to our dear researchers. And that, we are truly grateful to you, Sir Rex. Let us all give a clap icon in our chat box for our resource speaker, Dr. Rex A. Lim. We will now proceed to the question and answer. If you have some questions or clarifications, kindly write it in our chat box. Do we have questions in our chat box? Let us see.
Okay. Do we have some questions and clarifications? I think there is no clarification or question. It's all about notes of appreciation. Okay, so we will now proceed to the presentation of certificate of recognition. Okay, so while waiting for Dr. Myra to present the certificate of recognition, allow me to acknowledge our, face, our participants in this webinar. I would like to acknowledge our participants in this webinar. We have from Schools Division Office of Santa Rosa City, Laguna. We also have SNS, Katbalogan City, World City Colleges of Gimba, Nueva Ecija, STI College of Bigan City, Bulso Bustos Campus, St. Mary's University of Nueva Vizcaya. We also have San Man from San Manuel National High School of San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. We have from Ilocos Sur Polytechnic State Colleges. We have San Machas National High School of Minalin, Pampanga. We also have from Santa Maria National High School. We also have participants from Isabela, Malaybalay City, Palawan, Bustos, Bulacan, Camarines Sur, and Ilocos Sur. Thank you very much for following Beyond Books Publication FB page and YouTube channel Beyond Books Publication TV. Kindly subscribe, like, follow, and hit the notification bell in order for you to be notified and be updated with the Beyond Books publication. Okay, so the evaluation link is already posted in our chat box. Kindly answer the evaluation link in order to receive a certificate of participation for tonight's webinar. Okay, do we already have the certificate of recognition, Dr. Myra? Okay, allow me to read the content of the certificate of recognition. This certificate of recognition is presented to Dr. Rex A. Lim for being the resource speaker during the Beyond Books publication research talks for practical research one with the theme, select relevant literature, sites, given this 23rd day of April, 2021, signed by Dr. Leonilo B. Capulso, Chief Executive Officer or President of Beyond Books Publication. Congratulations, Sir Rex, Dr. Rex A. Lim, for your very informative presentation. And now, on behalf of Beyond Books Publication, I would like to ask your consent to post or upload your pictures for documentation purposes. Everyone is invited to open their camera for the pictorial. Congrats, Dr. Rex. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, very insightful, up-to-date. Yeah, we're, we're learning, we're learning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. 
and I, it's my first time to see um Dr. Santiago hi sir <laughs> uh, si RJ as well si sir Carbon hi sir Carbon sir Steve Doc Steve hi <laughs> And si Ma'am, uh, hi Ma'am Teresita. Thank you very much for opening your camera. I do appreciate your adorable smile. And now, may we call on our Practical Research Co-Chairman, Dr. Ruhel L. Santiago from Gordon Heights National High School City for the closing remarks. Thank you Ma'am Sherry. Am I audible now Ma'am? Yes sir. Okay, so good evening everyone. Uh, in behalf of Beyond Books Publication, I would like to extend uh, my deepest gratitude for those who are behind this program. Of course, uh, first and foremost, to Almighty God who always gives us uh, courage and wisdom for all our endeavors. No? To our very hardworking President CEO, Dr. Linila Bika Pulso, for guiding and leading us always in our journey as researchers, no? future researchers through programs like this. Uh, to the program chairman, Dr. Maria Teresita Calapis, who always take the lead in Practical Research One program. To our very competent speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Rex A. Lim. And I'm sure kaya wala na pong mga tanong dahil talagang na-present po no, ng mabuti yung inyong discussion. Okay? Um, for giving us wonderful insights through the topic you discussed a while ago. So congratulations po, sir. To our very supportive facilitator, Ma'am Sherry Garcia, who never hesitated to say yes now, every time we ask you to be a facilitator when someone else is not available. Thank you very much po, ma'am. To our ITs, uh, Dr. Myra Flores, uh, Sir Jamie Lokshon, ma'am uh, Maria Ebet Mignano, who always take charge in the flow of our program, and to the rest of the technical working group. So thank you very much not all of you. Uh, in every research talks that we are attending, I am very sure that all of us are learning and gaining new insights like uh, tonight. No? And these research talks we are doing every Wednesday and Friday will lead, us to be, will lead us to be researchers who will serve our community by addressing the needs and challenges we need to face. I know most of us are already tired because it's already Friday, but let us not be tired of learning. Let us not be tired of spending our time on this kind of initiatives uh, because again, it will help us to learn every single every single detail uh, in doing research. As what a quotation uh, is saying, the common facts of today are the products of yesterday's research. And I do believe uh, also that the common facts that we will have in the future are the products of today's research. And let us be grateful that uh, we will be contributors of today's research. So with that, uh, happy researching! Uh, happy researching! Thank you and babuhay tayong lahat. Okay po. So virtual round of applause po muna sa atin po lahat. Okay po. So I'm also pleased to present to you uh, the different books from Beyond Books publication that you can be used, no? especially our uh, teachers and students here uh, for research writing. We have a lot, uh, lot of books that can be availed from our library that will surely be helpful as you construct your research. Uh, Sir uh, J. Ben, meron po ba tayo mga list of books po natin dyan? Para po sa, ano po, para po ma-promote po natin na mabuti and as well as makita po ng ating mga viewers. So ito po yung uh, list of books po na mayroon po ang ating pong library no, na uh, surely ay magagamit po natin in doing and constructing our research. We have here, tingnan po natin, ano po yung mga ma-avail po natin ng mga books, no? We have here inquiries, investigations, and immersion. No? So for those uh, students who are uh, taking inquiries, investigations, and immersion, so we have our book here in our library. And we are proud to say uh, na yung ating po mga authors na ilan po dyan ay siya rin po mga speakers po natin dito sa ating pong, uh, research talks. No? We also have here how to write and publish your dissertation and how to write and publish your thesis. For those teachers who are currently enrolled in their uh, master and dissertation degrees, you may use and avail our books. No? We also have here uh, how to conduct an action research in education, especially we teachers are encouraged to do action research, no? to uh, actually to, sabi nga, para mabigyan, no? to address uh, specific problems we encounter in the educative process. No? We also have 
can we have next slide, sir? Uh, we also have here research methodology for quantitative and qualitative research. So for those who are uh, doing and writing their research, no, you may also avail and use uh, this book. No, para maintindihan natin yung sabi ng mga pasikot sikot sa paggawa po ng uh, research po. And also, meron pa po tayo no, na mga books po like yan, Practical Research 2, uh, Qualitative Research, no? uh, qu Quantitative Research, no? Quantitative Research. And ang isa po sa mga bagong-bago po natin is the International Journal of Advanced Multidisciplinary Studies. So, meron na po tayong dalawang volume po dyan. So, kung meron po tayong mga uh, research works, no, papers na gusto po nating mapublish, so, avail, no, at you may chat, email us. Later on, sabihin ko po sa inyo yung mga pwede nyo pong contact eh, na email and number as well para po mapublish ang inyo pong mga research work. At kagaya nga na binigay na talk ni Dr. Rex A. Lim na citation, ay malay po natin, no? Baka po tayo ay palarin na magamit din yung atin pong literary works no yung ating research work at masite din po ang ating name no para sa mga future uh, researches so avail no and sana po ay tayo po ay ano no mag magpa-publish po dito sa ating iGems no so you may contact our associate editor uh, Sir Joel N. De La Cruz no of course our uh, president CEO editor in chief Dr. Lino Leonilo B. Capulso you may also contact our managing editor, our program chair sa ating PR1 Talks, Dr. Maria Teresita G. Calapis. Pwede rin po natin kontakin ang ating pong, uh, mga IT experts, Dr. Mayra G. Flores. Of course, ang ating po isa rin sa IT, no? Sir J. Ben P. Lokshon. You may contact him also. And of course, ang, abong, ang ating editor-in-chief, no, no other than Dr. Linil B. Capulso. So you may uh, email us via boxpublication2018 at gmail.com or you may contact us 0933-556-4888. Uh, Meron po po tayo mga... Ano, yan. And of course, no, uh, we uh, would also like to invite you uh, on our upcoming International Multi Multidisciplinary Research Conference uh, this coming September 2021. And the host country will be Athens, Greece. No? This will be a collaboration of Philippines and Greece. Sabi nga, no? wala man tayo physically sa Greece, pero tayo ay makakarating sa Athens, Greece no? uh, by this coming September if we will join no? uh, this conference. So I am inviting, we are actually inviting you no, to submit your research abstracts and nomination. Marami po tayo mga nakaline up po na mga categories na pwede po nating salihan para po ma-recognize ang ating ano po, ang ating galing as educators, no? Uh, sabi nga worldwide, no? You may now submit your research abstracts and nomination. So further details are posted in our FB page uh, beyond books publication. So hurry and uh, kindly register. So with that, thank you and God bless po sa ating lahat. Thank okay. you very much, Sir Rio. We are through with our closing remarks. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Beyond Books Publication is so grateful for being with you tonight. We hope that you have learned from this webinar. See you again next week. Happy weekend. We can now leave the meeting room. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Cherry. Once again, thank you, Doc Rex. Thank, thank you, Doc you Doc Doy. Thank you, thank you, everyone, to our thank participants. Doc Tess, thank you. Our very supportive friends, Doc Steve, I can see him. And thank the rest. You okay. Welcome, po, Doc. Sir Augustine, I can see you here. Doc Meyer and Sir Jabin, thank you. Our students, thank you. We hope to be with you for the next sessions. And we hope to serve you through this initiative of our speakers and facilitators. Pag-ingat tayong lahat palagi. 
You may now leave our session room. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Doc Lourdes, Bascuña, our ever active, perfect attendance from uh, the university. Thank you, thank you. Happy weekends po sa ating lahat. Sir Rex, thank you. Dr. Rex, thank you very much. Mom Sherry, thank you po. Thank you po. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Napaka comprehensive ng bago paliwanag. Ang galing-galing po. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am Teresita, thank you rin po. Dr. Doy, thank you po. Salamat po, Dr.